are so grateful uh, to Dr. David Yongi Cho for bringing that wonderful dance troupe to us and uh, expressing their aloha from Seoul, Korea. Pastor Cho is pastor of Yoiro Full Gospel Christian Church in Seoul, Korea. He began with five members and it has grown to more than 750,000 members. Only the Holy Spirit could do that through a humble man. Dr. Cho has written um, more than a hundred books, and one of his books is on prayer and revival, and that in fact won the Gold Medallion Award from the Christian Evangelical Book Distributors Association. In addition, he has in his ministry preached to more than 11 million people by now. We are so grateful that he was led to speak to our conference we are so fortunate to have him with us to talk to us about the importance of prayer and how it began with his church and how prayer is important for revival. Please welcome and give a warm aloha to Pastor David Cho. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. When we two or three gather together in his name, he is always present with us. So this morning, it is more important to see Jesus among us than Joe. <laughs> Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is going to minister to our heart this morning. So let's expect great things to happen. Bible says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. So this morning, I do believe that Jesus Christ will feel the desire of your heart. And she will impart into your heart great joy and peace and victory. 1958, I graduated at Bible Institute. And the Holy Spirit led my heart to go into one of the most poor areas of Seoul City slum area to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I went out there and pitched up a small U.S. Marine tent and threw a dozen sheets of the mattress and I began to preach. At the beginning I felt that uh, it would be not so difficult to build church among the slum area, but uh, it was not so easy. I preached day after day, week after week, month after month, but nothing happened. People would not come. I preached about heaven and hell, and I preached about judgment, all of the traditional gospel of Jesus Christ, but I could not get any result at all. And I was so discouraged. And many a times I wondered if God really called me into ministry. I began to doubt my own calling, and I almost wanted to give up my ministry because it's surely so clear to see that I was failing leading soul to Jesus Christ. Then one day a turning point came in my life, and everything became new in my ministry. And suddenly the door of heaven opened, and great things started to happen. One day, my mother-in-law to be and with me together went to visit one very poverty-stricken family. This family was a refugee from North Korea, and the husband and wife had nine boys, and the husband was a confirmed alcoholic for more than 10 years, and his wife was suffering from stomach trouble and heart trouble. Nine children were out on the street, shining the shoes and picking the pocket. So they were just a beggar family. And we went to visit his home and wanted to lead them to Jesus Christ. And when I knocked on the door, the lady threw open the door and she said, Who are you? So we are 
preachers from next town, and we came here to bring the good news to you. She says, what good news? Says, Jesus Christ is Savior, and he wants to give heaven to you. Her eyes suddenly began to glare. She said, heaven, you all Christian liar. You Christians are talking about the beautiful heaven after death. But how about now? We are living in terrible sickness and disease and poverty. If God is so good to give a wonderful heaven after death, why wouldn't he give something good to us right now? How could you prove, prove heaven after death if you can't prove living God right now? And she was preaching to me and I was convinced. So I said, well, but if you don't receive Jesus, you would go to hell. She laughed and she said, hell? You look at my home. We are already living in hell. What <laughs> hell could be harder than the hell right now we are in? Get out of our house. You are a liar. There are no heaven, no hell. So I could not say any more word to her because she spoke to me and I was thoroughly persuaded by her speaking. I said, that's right, they are already living in hell. <laughs> Very small room. There they live. Nine children, parents all together, 11 people. They could hardly lie down there in small room. They had only one blanket. Miserable. So already they are living in hell. So I was really stooped down and I came back to our tent church and I knelt down before the Lord. I said, Lord, what message do I have left to preach to them? These people are starving, suffering, sick, hopeless. And here now, I want to bring heaven to them, but they won't accept the truth of heaven. And they are not scared, even though I preach about hell. What message do I have to speak to them? I said, I have nothing to speak to them. And I began to pray. Then the Spirit spoke to my heart. Why don't you start reading the four gospel again? In new light, not in a theological way, but in a real lifestyle way. So I began to read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John again with new determination to find the ministry of Jesus Christ. And amazingly, Jesus Christ never spoke about heaven or about God. Jesus gave God, Jesus gave heaven instead of speaking about God and heaven. Here I was speaking about God, about heaven, but I will not give them God and heaven right now. They were living in terrible need in their lives. But I will not meet their need. I was just talking God in the, above the cloud. Jesus Christ, wherever he went, he forgave the sins and gave them the peace and joy and the glory. He healed the sick. He delivered them from the thrall of the Satan. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. He met their dire needs. Then he preached the kingdom of God. And who wouldn't accept the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is already proved in their lives. And Jesus was very practical and pragmatical. He was not, not talking about the, theory, but he was practicing what he preached. So I said, Jesus, can I do the same thing? I've been talking about God who live in a million miles away. I've been talking about God, heaven, which I'm not even sure in my own heart. So, how can I lead them to believe? Can I speak like you, like you speak? Can I do as you do? I was really praying and praying. In those days, I was praying five hours every day. From 4.30 in the morning, I would come to the church and I would pray. Then after breakfast, then also I pray for more than five hours. Of course, I didn't have much to do in those days because I had no 
members to visit and counsel. So the only thing I could do was kneeling down and praying. So after much prayer, I was armed with new idea, and I went back to her home again. Now I was not ready to speak about Jesus or about heaven. I was ready to give Jesus. I was about to give heaven to them. So I knocked her, and she threw open the door, and she was very angry. Why do you come again? We don't need you. But I said, you need me today. I have come today here to introduce someone who could deliver your husband from alcoholism. I come here to introduce someone who could heal your stomach trouble and heart trouble. And I've come here to introduce you to the, that someone who could educate your nine children and who could give you a nice home, hygienic life. And she said, who is that person? I said, Jesus Christ. He said, is he living right now? I said, yes, he's living. Where is he? I said, follow me. She stood up and she came out of her room. She took her sandal and she began to follow me. Oh, I said, wonderful. Last time when I was talking about heaven and hell, she was angry. But this time when I talk about someone who could meet the need, then she would follow me. So I said, this is right. I've got to meet the need of people instead of trying to teach them about doctrine. So she followed me through the rice paddy and hill, and finally we came to the church. And she said, where is your church? I said, this is my church. The very old torn tent, standing twisted, and even cross. I made the cross by myself and put up on the tent. And she lifted up the flip of the tent and looked into the inside. Then she began to laugh. <laughs> she looked into my eyes. Sir, you are no better off than I am. <laughs> so I said, that is right. I'm no better off than you. But you need Jesus, I need Jesus, who would meet our need. He is the living God. He is same yesterday, today, and forever. And he would meet our need. He is not religion. He is not philosopher. He is going to meet our need. She nodded her head. Why don't you start coming an early morning prayer meeting from tomorrow? We will seek his face and he is going to meet our need. Since I was telling her, Jesus who meet the need, she began to come to church. And we prayed for three months for deliverance of her husband from alcoholism. And surely Christ came and met our need and he was delivered from alcoholism. Since that time, he never touched the alcohol at all. He was wonderfully saved and delivered. <laughs> then he found a job and he began to bring the rice, he began to feed his family, then by the help of government, we got the loan and purchased a small house, remodeled, and she began to live in beautiful hygienic home. Then God began to bless her husband more, and they began to send all the children through the school. And there, Jesus proved himself that he was meeting the need of people. And I was very, very encouraged. When I was trying to teach doctrines and theology to them, nobody would listen to me, nobody would come. But when I was introducing Jesus who would meet our daily need, then they would come. And I really poured out my heart before the Lord and I studied the Bible. And I began to see very clearly that it is God's will to see whole person saved. When Adam and Eve fell, he lost threefold blessings. Adam was dead spiritually. He lost his spiritual life. And 
he was announced to die. He lost finally his health and he became sick and died. Then he lost the blessing of God. The earth was cursed, and earth began to bring the thorns and thistles. So threefold calamity began to follow after Adam and Eve and his children. So whole world has been under the thrall of the three calamities. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to the world earth, and he took all of the threefold calamities. The spiritual death, physical death, and curse on earth on his own body. And he went on the cross and he paid all the penalty for ourselves. His flesh was torn and he shed his blood. Through his suffering, he paid off all the penalties. And he delivered us from the threefold calamities. Instead of spiritual death, he gave us spiritual life, eternal life. Instead of the physical sickness and disease, he took our infirmities and carried away our sicknesses, and by his stripes he was healed. Then, finally, he would give us resurrection and eternal life. And also, he delivered us from the curse. Bible says, Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 13, that Christ was, has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs up on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon Gentiles. So, when I see the falling of the Adam and Eve, they brought threefold calamities, but when we see the last Adam, Jesus, he conquered all threefold calamities, and he started to give us threefold blessings. And it was God's intention to see whole person saved, not only spiritual person, but God wanted whole person saved and blessed. So through that experience, I was deeply convinced in my heart that God would come and meet the need of our spirit, our physical need, and our livelihood, the need of our livelihood. And then I on that foundation began to preach very strong about threefold blessing of Jesus Christ. And the way for us to receive threefold blessing is to pray and seek the face of the Lord. And people began to come. I had many wonderful blessings uh, through that ministry. Especially, you know, those people who live in slum area, they are living in deep inferiority complex and also condemnation. They live in conviction of sin and under the deep condemnation because they are alcoholic, they are gangsters, they steal, and uh, they uh, are narcotic addicted people, and they themselves condemn their lives. And they think that they will not have any future and hope. So I would come to them and I say that, come as you are to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took your old condemnation on the cross and by torn flesh and shed blood, he paid off all of your condemnation. It's free of charge. By the grace, through simple faith, you can be delivered from the condemnation and sin. Christ will give you the righteousness and the glory into your life. I spoke very strong that this is present experience. You are not going to experience these kind of things after death. Christ is here and he forgives you, delivers you from the condemnation, delivers you from the heart pain, gives you the righteousness and experience of glory. And by and by people begin to listen. And more than anything else, I began to preach very strong from the healing from the sickness, because people were living in that unhygienic situation. So many people were dying from sickness and disease. They had a tuberculosis especially, and cancer, arthritis, every kind of sickness, what you name. And so many children were dying, love of the hygiene. So I preached very strong about divine healing, but I had no vision from the Lord about healing gift. I prayed very much, oh God, I want to hear any voice from the Lord that you are giving me, gift of healing. But 
I didn't see anything. I tried to dream, but no dream happened to me. <laughs> and I tried to do the vision, but only I saw the spe spe spot and speckles of the light in my eyes. <laughs> no vision, no dream. But only I could read the Bible and I could see the truth that Jesus Christ took our infirmities and carried away our sicknesses. And my heart conviction that it, it, it was the will of the Lord to see whole person saved. So one day, I fasted and prayed very much, and I said, Lord, to live or die, float or drown, I'm going to practice what I believe. I'm going to give healing Jesus to them instead of talking about healing 2,000 years ago. So at those days, I had only few Christians coming, and I announced to them on Sunday service, that from this evening, I will have a healing ministry. And uh, dumbs are going to talk, blinds are going to open, eyes, cripples are going to rise up. Wonderful miracles are going to happen. While I was talking like that, I was trembling like this. <laughs> because I personally had never seen any those things happen in my life. <laughs> and I was just talking out of the Bible. Then, through the afternoon, I was praying and I said, Lord, now I very boldly, by faith, announced, but I'm trembling. I've never seen those things happen in my life yet. And if you would fail this evening, my ministry would be over. I will be found as a liar. God intervened. And as the evening service approached, I really regretted that I had announced such a way. I said I could have a very peaceful ministry with a few Christians in the church <laughs> instead of having this turbulence in my heart. But when I went out in the tent church, that place was packed with people. This was marvelous because when I talked, Jesus who meet our daily need, people would come because they are in need, great need. They need to be met by Jesus Christ. So I preached very boldly about healing Jesus. Then after the service sermon, I said, since I announced the healing this morning in, in such a short notice, you wouldn't have had the time to bring uh, very difficult cases of sick people. And I just hoped in my heart that they would only bring uh, someone who has some headache and uh, cold <laughs> and some pain on the arm, some those kind of people. Because I was not ready to handle the heavy case. <laughs> so I said, you, those one who are having cold or headache <laughs> or pain on your back, I'm ready to pray. Then one young man far back there lifted his head and says, Pastor, I says, what is that? I've brought here two born deaf and dumb. I said, Lord, you should not do this thing to me. Born deaf and dumb. Who could handle this kind of heavy case? Oh, my heart really sank. I said, this is the end of my ministry today. <laughs> but I could not show any of those kind of fear. And I said, boldly, stretching up, and I said, bring them. Bring them here. <laughs> All people were looking at me, and those two girls, one girl was skinny and tall, and the, the other girl was uh, small and pleasantly plump. And they were brought on the platform, and they seemed very puzzled. They did not know that why they were coming here. So I said, I will pray as Jesus prayed for the deaf and dumb, and God will confirm with miracles. I talked like that, but I doubted in my heart. <laughs> so I would put my finger, oh, no, before I pray, I said, Lord, which one would be easier case? <laughs> if I fail 
from the beginning, then everything would be finished. So show me the easier case. But no revelation came. That was uh, very, very hard for me. You know, many spiritual people would receive very easy revelation, visions, and dream. But through 45 years of my ministry, I've never had any clear vision, nor ever I heard any voice from the Lord instead of through the Bible. So I said, oh God, show me, show me. But nothing was shown to me, and I only thought, well, the devil which you've been a skinny girl would be a skinny devil. <laughs> and the devil which you've been in a, in a pleasant plump girl would be a strong devil. So I said, you skinny girl, come. <laughs> it's a very simple theory. So I would put my finger into her ears, and I began to pray. I said, Lord, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? <laughs> I'm desperate. You've got to answer to me. This is the beginning of my healing ministry, and if I fail this case, I am finished. So I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, your deaf and dumb spirit, come out of her. Come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. But I could not pull out my finger. I was so afraid. So I prayed some more. I commanded some more. Then I prayed some more. I commanded some more. Then all the people began to wonder why I was uh, lingering so long. And I could not wait any longer. I said, Christ, if possible, come now so that we will be all resurrected and go to heaven.